Welcome to Smart Catalyst, December 24, 2018. So today we are going to see all these articles. The first one is Vulnerability Index. The second one is Indonesia Tsunami. The third one is Agni 4 Missile. The fourth one is No Rise in Working Women Despite High Literacy Rates. And the fifth one is Andaman to Get Undersea Cable. So the first article is Vulnerability Index. So recently the Department of Science and Technology gave a report which states that all the 12 Himalayan states in India they are extremely vulnerable to global warming and in that list or in that report they stated Assam is the most vulnerable followed by Mizoram and then followed by Jammu and Kashmir. So these are very very vulnerable to the global warming. So what is the report name means it is climate vulnerability assessment for the Indian Himalayan region IHR using a common framework. They took four indicators for coming to this conclusion, the first indicator is economic and sociological status of the people and their health. The second one is possible impact on agricultural production. The third one is forest dependent livelihoods. And the fourth indicator is access to information services and infrastructure. So if you see in this picture how the states were actually scored means the states which were having the lower per capita income and lower area under irrigation as well as lower area under forests per thousand households but high area under open forests. So whichever state which is having all these phenomena together that state received a high vulnerability score that means it is very very vulnerable. So in that only Assam scores the top that means it is very vulnerable followed by Mizoram, Jammu and Kashmir and in the same list Sikkim and Uttarakhand are somewhat lower vulnerable than the Assam, Mizoram and Jammu and Kashmir. So it is. It doesn't portray that Sikkim and Uttarakhand or Arunachal Pradesh are low vulnerability in an absolute real sense. It is somewhat less vulnerable than the Assam, Mizoram, etc. So if you see, these are the 12 states in the IHR Indian Himalayan region: Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, and Sikkim, West Bengal. And these four states: Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, Assam, Tripura, and Meghalaya. So only the vulnerability index is calculated for these 12 Himalayan states. Okay. So why Assam is the most vulnerable in the Indian Himalayan region means because it is having least area under irrigation. They mostly dependent on rain fed and it is also having least forest area available per thousand rural households and it is second lowest per capita income among the IHR states. So due to all these factors only the Assam is the most vulnerable in that Indian Himalayan region. In the same list, Sikkim is the least vulnerable state with an index of 0.42 and Assam is having 0.72. So why they gave this kind of report means it actually helped the researchers and the policy makers to identify the scale of vulnerability in the Indian Himalayan region. Thereby, they can assist in designing the adaptation interventions which are specific to each state and region in that particular Indian Himalayan region. So why they have chosen the Indian Himalayan ecosystem means because it is vital to India's ecological security and it only feeds perennial rivers which in turn provide drinking water, irrigation and hydropower projects etc. And also there they conserve a lot of biodiversity and providing a rich base for high value agriculture. And on the other hand it is also enhances the tourism. So the Himalayan communities have a large dependency on climate sensitive sectors such as the rain fed agriculture and it is also have a fragile mountain ecosystem. So the communities which survive in the Indian Himalayan ecosystem they have only limited livelihood options and the same communities also experience higher marginalization because they don't have that much physical infrastructure like roads or transport or markets or power supply etc because these all kind of infrastructure is very limited in the Indian Himalayan region and there is a high dependence only on the natural resources. So under this changing and variable climate condition these constraints are likely to add the vulnerability of the Himalayan communities even more. So now we are going to see about this Himalayan ecosystem. It is the largest, tallest mountain range in the world and it borders 8 countries which covers an area of 43 square kilometer lakhs and nearly 1.5 people directly or indirectly depend on the Himalaya for water, food and energy. So our total world population is nearly like 7 billion, right? So in that 1.5 billion is depending directly on or indirectly on the Himalayas. So 
we can easily understand this Indian Himalayan region is a lifeline for millions of people across the country. Nearly 20% of our country's population are directly dependent on Indian Himalayan region and its resources. So this kind of report aims towards better understanding of the climate change vulnerability. Thereby we can devise adaptation strategy for that Indian Himalayan region. So also from the government side, the center has a mission for Himalayan region in order to conserve that. That mission is national mission for sustaining the Himalayan ecosystem. So the next article is Indonesia tsunami. So the news here is nearly 200 people were killed as the tsunami hit the coastal areas along the western Java and the southern Sumatra island which surrounds the Anak Krakatau volcanic island. So what the news here is, the tsunami has smashed into a lot of houses, hotels and other buildings Saturday night along Indonesia's Sunda Strait. So this is the Sunda Strait which connects the Indian Ocean to the Java Sea. So here only that event actually had occurred, which is a disaster that followed an eruption and possible landslide on the Anak Krakatau, which is one of the world's most infamous volcanic island. So it was the second deadly tsunami to hit Indonesia this year alone. And one major concern here is the ground didn't shake beforehand to alert the people about the oncoming wave, which actually had ripped a lot of buildings and houses. So there is no possibility for uh, taking any kind of precautionary measures in order to save the people. So this is that Anak Krakatau volcano. So it actually erupts, which causes the land to slide. Thereby it creates the waves of tsunami. Okay. So this is what happened in that Anak Krakatau. So the volcanic eruption actually lead to the landslide. Thereby it causes the tsunami. So this tsunami was caused by an undersea landslide. So it was actually occurred under the sea from the volcanic activity of that Anak Krakatau. So how this tsunami occurs means it could have been caused by the landslides which is caused because of the eruption of Anak Krakatau volcano and not only because of this but there could be a possibility that the tidal waves which is caused by the full moon. So on the same day the full moon event has also occurred and this full moon could exert a lot of gravitational pull in addition so both these things increases the intensity of the tides thereby it further turns into a severe tsunami so if you see from the background it has been erupting this volcano has been erupting since june and before the event of tsunami also before 24 minutes again it has been erupted so now we are going to see about this anak krakatau volcanic island so if you see here this is that anak krakatau volcanic island so it is it means Anak means child, it is child of Krakatau. So there was already one island or volcano which is Krakatau and from that only this an high Anak Krakatau has been formed. And this volcano lies on the island in the Sunda Strait between Java and Sumatra Island. So Sumatra and Java Island and it links the Indian Ocean to the Java Sea. Okay. So now we are going to see how this Anak Krakano Volcano has been formed over the years. So if you see in 1883, we already had an eruption of Krakato Volcano, which is one of the largest and most devastating volcano in the history. And after certain years, around 1920s, this Krakato Volcano leads to the formation of, so this Anak Krakato continues to grow each year and erupts periodically, although it is much smaller than the previous Krakato Volcano. So we all knew that any volcano which is having eruption also having deposition. So similarly in this case also this Mount Krakato leads to continuous eruption and deposition which leads to the formation of this Anak Krakato volcano which is the child of the Krakato volcano. Okay. So if you see in this picture here is the Krakato volcano. So as we saw before this tsunami was caused by an undersea landslide resulting from the volcanic activity of that Anak Krakatau mountain and it was occurred actually in this Indonesian region right. So this Indonesia is a vast archipelago of more than 17,000 islands and it is a home to nearly 260 million people. And this Indonesia actually lies along the Pacific ring of fire. So this Pacific Ring of Fire is an arc of 
volcanoes as well as the fault lines in the Pacific Basin. So this Pacific Ring of Fire is actually having major active volcanoes and plate boundaries because of that it is more vulnerable region. Okay. So now we are going to see what this landslide means because this tsunami which had occurred in this Indonesia is because of the landslide and not because of any kind of earthquakes. So in that sense we are now going to see what this landslide means. Landslide generally means sliding of land or sliding piece of land. It may occur over the surface or the ground or under the sea. So in this case it actually had occurred under the sea. And what could be the possibilities for this kind of landslide means? It might be due to external forces such as over rainfall, snow melting or volcanic eruption in this case and also earthquakes. Earthquakes can also cause this landslide and anthropogenic activity. So the next article is Agni 4. So the news here is this nuclear capable long range ballistic missile Agni 4 has been successfully test fired on the Abdul Kalam island in Odisha coast. So in that context now we are going to see about this Agni series. So this Agni series has been developed under in Integrated Guided Missile Development Program by DRDO and as per this Agni series until now we are having 5 Agni ballistic missiles 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and Agni 1, 2, 3 have already been deployed in the service and 4 and 5 are now under trials and in that only now the Agni 4 has been actually successfully completed its all trial. So if you see the strike range of each and every Agni series, it actually ranges from 700 to 5500 kilometer strike range and Agni 2 has like 2500, it is 3500 and it is having 4000 kilometer strike range. So if you see here its strike range is 4000 kilometer and it is short range as the kilometers indicate and it is medium range and it is intermediate and it is long range and it is intercontinental ballistic missile. So if you see here the Agni 5 which is the latest in the Agni series until now is having very high capacity of attacking intercontinental range up to China in the eastern side and western Europe or central Europe in the western side. So this Agni 4 is a two stage missile which is having a weight of 17 tons and it is equipped with advanced avionics which is a fifth generation onboard computer and distributed architecture. And it is having some kind of latest feature thereby it can easily correct and guide the missile for in-flight disturbances. If any kind of disturbances occur it correct automatically and it is having rinse and minx. So and also we are having this rinse and minx technology thereby we can ensure that the vehicle reaches the target with very high accuracy. So also one more thing you have to note here is these all are ballistic missiles and they are not cruise missiles. So these ballistic missiles like Agni 1, 2, 3 which was already inducted in the service and Prithvi. So these all can make India an effective deterrence capability after the induction of this Agni 4 and 5. So the next article is no rice in working women despite of high literacy rates. So this ICRIER which is Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. So they actually released a report which is telling about the anomaly of women's work and education in India. Even though the women are getting higher education, it is not getting reflected in terms of labors. So what they actually suggested in this report is based on the Labor Bureau's employment figure, they have come to a conclusion that the percentage of women who are out of the labor force who are going out of the job there is a rise in that uh, percentage between the year 2011 to 2015 across all levels of education and age cohorts so what they actually telling here is even though the women are getting graduate degrees and above but they are not coming into the labor force and this percentage has increased from 62 to 65 percentage and also the percentage of illiterate women who are out of labor force they are also getting increased from 67 to 70 percentage so one thing you have to note here is the gross enrollment ratio which indicates the enrollment of uh, boys and girls into the educational opportunities it actually shows that there are equal numbers of boys and girls at secondary level and even women remain for a longer time in terms of education than boys so this is 
contrary to what they now actually predicted because the re rise in literacy especially in terms of women has not translated into jobs for women so this is what they indicate in this report so what could be the factors for this recent trend means the role the education plays in marriage markets so women get education not for job or not for any kind of economic activities but only for social status and for marriage so this is what justified by means of this data that is if you see nearly 60 percent of women which constituting nearly 0.4 percent of total population were working so and the remaining women are purely dependent so even though the women are highly educated because of their higher social status and because of the social norms engulfing our society their families actually keep their women out of the workforce they are not allowing them to go to work and also the quality of education which is available it is also very poor and there is a poor condition for educated women also in our country so what they actually telling as a way forward or way ahead is they recommend that the government policy should focus on the behavioral change of the people which consider the female employment as more acceptable in our society so this is what they suggested so we should change the mindset of the people we should change the be behaviors of the people towards the women's job or working women so one thing you have to note here is in this gross enrollment ratio india wants to attain 30 percentage of gross enrollment ratio by 2020 but if you see china and us they were already like 43 percent and 80 percent but now we are trying to achieve only 30 percent by 2020 so the last article is andaman to get undersea cable so what the news here is there is a proposal to provide high speed internet connection to increase the communication infrastructure especially during the natural disaster in the andaman and nicobar island through an undersea optical cable system so now the ministry of environment forest and climate change have actually accepted this proposal in order to lay down this undersea optical cable system okay. so if you see here this undersea optical cable it is from chennai to andaman nicobar island so which is also known as chennai andaman nicobar cable system and it is aiming to have a speed of 100 gigabits per second this is strategic significance to india in addition to islands communication system already we are having islands communication security by means of satellite but at present this satellite communication is only having limited bandwidth capacity so by means of this uh, cable optical cable system we can increase the communication infrastructure even more so this submarine cable system will connect indian mainland from chennai to eight islands of this andaman nicobar they are these eight and this total route length is 2100 kilometers